Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm super excited to welcome Lillian Chichercia to our program. Hello there, Lillian. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thanks for having me, Daniel. Uh, it's it's an honor to chat with you and meet you uh, in this space. And I think our guests are going to be super uh, interested in your research. Um, I, Lillian's doing a lot of really interesting work on political thought, political theory, um, looking at issues of class, looking at issues really that I think are kind of, at least within the field of philosophy, kind of understudied. Mm -hmm. I was initially drawn to your uh, essay, Why Class Matters, which we're going to talk about a bit, as well as some of your stuff in Jacobin Magazine. And of course, you're uh, um, one of the co-hosts of, of a very interesting podcast, um, which, which you can tell us about. And I know you guys do... Um, like all kinds of interesting and you do guys you guys do quite a lot tell us tell us about the podcast to begin with in case my <laughs> listeners are less familiar um with with your yeah. podcast the, the podcast is called what's left of philosophy and it's hosted by myself and will paris and gil morihon and owens and williams and um they run that episodes run about an hour long and we just tend to um chat about whatever is interesting to us and um, usually some figure that's recognizable in philosophy and then we kind of attack it from um I ideally a kind of a left-wing perspective which we think is generally absent in uh, professional philosophy so that's actually a good place to start Lillian which is the question of the absence of left-wing thinking <laughs> in philosophy that's not immediately apparent that it's absent because I think maybe it would be helpful for you to start off by saying a few things about that. Why, why, why is professional philosophy not sufficiently left oriented in your view? Um, I know that's a hard well, question. Um, I'll just keep it simple. Like I, it's not that I don't think people, individuals are left wing or that they even have to be. I don't really actually care that much if all of professional philosophy is um, left wing. Um, there's more, there's obvious conservative strains. There's some philosophy that is, you know, ostensibly politically neutral. You can always like pick at it and to show how it's political, but you know, not, not everything is responsive to like the, the conser social and political concerns that I have. Um, but I would say just an, an orientation on, um, not just redistribution, but, changing the dynamics of, of power in favor of the poor in society, in favor of working people, where like the basic question that one asks oneself is what is best for working people is not usually what is going on. Um, and then moral universalism, like in that um, what we are trying to do is make things better for everybody, um, not just people who are less advantaged, but understanding that advantage and disadvantage are always relative terms to something. And that what the left's job is to do is to raise the floor for everybody. Yeah. So um, it's that background condition of like, what are you relatively advantaged or disadvantaged against? Mm -hmm. That Most philosophical discourse and mainstream liberal discourse is preoccupied with disparities. Um, and the background condition of those disparities is what I take the left to need to integrate into this discussion. If you have a left-wing perspective, you want to push the conversation in the direction of universally making things better for everybody with respect to some background condition that um, makes people suffer or is unjust. Yeah, because a lot of what you write about is the question of domination. And in a way, it becomes an interesting avenue by which we understand class oppression, in part because there's an, a certain argument coming out of Republican thought, which I want to invite you to actually talk about, because at first blush, it's not immediately apparent why the broader philosophical political orientation of Republicanism would actually lend itself to a pretty 
crisp and pretty robust understanding of the way that the the market and the labor market and wage labor produces conditions of domination and servitude. And that in fact, those conditions, um, Republicanism has a built in uh, adversity or opposition to thinking about any reinforcement of that kind of servitude relation. So can, can we start by you unpacking maybe a bit about that question of domination and the philosophical tradition of republicanism, neo-republicanism, and so on, and maybe clarifying a few things there for for people. Sure. Um, so I think that you know the the republican way of thinking about domination as a form of arbitrary power, um, and arbitrary and arbitrary power is basically a compa a capacity. Whether you use it or not, you know you can have a benevolent slave master. So the um, usual, is it an analogy or a metaphor? I guess analogy goes, um, you know, if you have a benevolent slave master, they are still a slave master. You know, they don't have to treat you badly, but they can. And if those conditions exist, then one is dominated. Um, well, I, and I think that domination simply became the normative language that seemed useful for getting at the background conditions that I was talking about previously. So, you know, some of these choices in the direction you would go with republicanism, or at least reasons I did, you know, some of them have to do with intellectual trends. There was available normative resources that were compelling to me as a graduate student um, that other traditions were not offering. And so if in the long run, you know, republicanism doesn't pan out to be the project of all projects um, in normative political philosophy, um, it's pointing out something that I think is missing now. And that is mostly what, um, if you do political theory or political philosophy, that is mostly your job is to assess the current debates versus reality and figure out what is missing. And at the moment, I think that um, republicanism is through the concept of domination, um, helping me to find language to, to do that. Um, and I think that there are more, con there are certainly conservative kinds of republicanisms. There are conservative forms of liberalism. Um, there's a conservative wing to every kind of normative project that lacks explicit political content. Um, and so republicanism can certainly be an elite, you know, constitutional project. Um, it can be a kind of Habermasian EU project, which I think is also an elite constitutional project, but, you know, some people interpret it differently. Um, civic patriotism or, or whatever. Um, and then there's also republicanisms that, you know, follow in the legacy of um, Frederick Douglass or Mary Wollstonecraft or um, the, the American labor movement or the um, German council movement. Um, and so there are more subaltern Republican and Republicans who, you know, the French Revolution, you know, the Paris Commune, mm -hmm. Some people have argued that Marx himself, you know, William Clay Roberts has said Marx himself is a Republican. Um, Bruno Leopold is also making similar arguments. Um, so there's a diversity and it might not be apparent, but it kind of depends on, on who you read. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one way to think about it that I kind of, that I see in someone like Axel Honneth's idea of socialism lectures, mm -hmm. which I know you're familiar with. <laughs> He's a um, former director of the Frankfurt School, late Frankfurt School, stepped down in 2018. And he had this kind of interesting idea that if you follow the kind of modern political system and you look at these kind of three zones of political life that the French Revolution opened up, um, you know, the sphere of liberty, like market sphere, the sphere of uh, the nation, like fraternity. And then um, what's the the other one? This The sphere of... Um, uh, so liberty, fraternity, and then egalitarianism, the state. So like egalitarianism vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state. Well, he says that in a way, the sphere of, of libertas, of the sphere of the market itself, um, that Marxists uh, were too vulgar and deterministic about trying to achieve a form of subjective freedom by emphasizing too much this sphere, right? And that in a way they didn't maybe balance their demands properly. And I wanna invite you to talk a little bit about mm 
that dynamic? Because that really interests me in a way to think about our political tradition in those three zones. And, you know, even I would just say, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but this is a tripartite scheme uh, that the Japanese Marxist philosopher Kojin Karatani also works with. Um, and he does some quite sophisticated things with it. Um, and I really like it because it kind of, it kind of connects modernity in one broad sweep and shows that these three spheres of civic life have a kind of implicit interaction together mm -hmm. and that political struggles need to kind of adequately link all three in a certain sense. But let's, so, so that's a little bit of background, but let me, let me invite you to talk a little bit about um, how the left has been perceived perhaps wrongly as being way too economically deterministic because this is one big thing that you attack to talk, talk a little bit about the economic determinism piece and like parse that out for us a little bit please okay yeah sure um can i ask you one point of clarification something yeah. about what Hanit said about the the different um spheres there's a comment before vulgar and deterministic um about how they focus too much on the one sphere um this is a pretty i i this is a pretty like common what was it distinct distinctly that Hanith said about that the, that you in his in his idea of socialism lectures which i wrote a review of a few mm -hmm. years back he did make the claim that part of what the air of the workers movement of 19th century up to 20th mm -hmm. was too much of an onus placed on the site of worker emancipation without an adequate focus on the way that the sphere of the economy has an overlap with civil society. And he thought that the workers movement from like angles, especially forward, really uh, deprivileged the sphere of personal life, uh, civic life, civic participation, civic identity, etc and that they uh, thought liberation too centered on worker emancipation. That was, and I think that you actually touched on that in your um, critique of Honeth in Jacobin. Isn't that basically the kind of way that you would analyze or sort of summarize? Well, I invite you to further elaborate. Yeah, you know, I I think that um, the, the first question is whether or not, um, it's a fair criticism of the Marxist tradition. And then the second question is whether or not that kind of claim, like the opposing claim is, is true. So I think that it's um, probably true, like the, the criticism is probably fair of some parts of the Marxist tradition, um, but also I don't think it's fair in, in general. Like you're talking about people who, um, that you're talking about poor people, working people who forced their way onto the political stage, demanded democratic rights, and whose first priority in many cases was the expansion of those rights, set up their own civil society organizations everywhere in the world. Everywhere you look in which socialists and communists have organized, they have set up their own civil society organizations. Most of the debate about the how to participate in parliamentary formations or under even authoritarian context is basically how to maintain political independence in a democratic state or to how to have an organization that is in some way subterranean but able to act collectively. So the idea that these are people who in general like are somehow dismissive of civil society or the state is to me just a dogma that academics have created for themselves. Um, I don't think it's a, it's, um, there's a real problem in there, but it's not a problem that I see as obvious in every Marxist yeah. writer or in every socialist um, uh, movement or organization that I'm aware of. There's a real ignorance about the history of the left, unfortunately. People take their lead from these kinds of claims that someone like Hanek makes, and then it becomes true. Um, secondly, you know, the question about whether or not we have the conversation should be about different spheres. Um, you know, really, my, the reason I think that 
the answer to the, the response to that should be like, is that kind of claim true? Is like, I wonder, you know, we talk about the state or civil society. I have to ask concretely what people are talking about. How independent are they really? You know, and we have these conversations in um, philosophy where it's like, well, if there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between what capitalists want and pe what people are doing in the state or in civil society, then that must mean that Marxists are wrong. It's not wholly determined by what capitalists want and therefore Marxists are vulgar. That's usually how the argument goes. This is actually like a really unsophisticated thing, set of things to say. It's the mm -hmm. mirror image of the thing that they think that they are criticizing. Um, I don't think that anyone who does Marxist state theory now, or probably even in the past, had such a naive view. Um, there are a deep set of structural dependencies that capitalist states have on capital. So does civil society. So like, if you think about, you know, concretely what's in civil society, NGOs, churches. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'll start with NGOs. It's rather apparent that they are completely dependent on a set of funding sources that um, whether it's directly from private interests or from the state, which means that they depend on public tax revenue, which is an indirect way of talking about they're dependent on the base of employment and therefore cap capital creating jobs and capitalist investment. So the idea that having separate spheres gets you out of some kind of like vulgar problem is to me just like a re-vulgarization of the problem. Mm -hmm. And I've come to think that like separate spheres are is basically a conservative way of thinking about things because you have this one thing called the economy and you always need to go beyond it, which means that you always make it into a black box because you, you decide that there's nothing else to see here. We always need to circumvent this thing. Mm. And so then you never actually talk about how the capital, how the economy influences these other institutions in a particularly robust way. You just decide it can't explain much. And mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to other topics. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I set that question up partly to play devil's advocate, just so we're clear, because I'm not an I'm not a supporter of Honneth's orientation. And no, I no, I understand. That, I, I yeah, 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 yeah. But but yeah, you know how it goes as an interviewer. You have to play that game. Mm -hmm. um, but you know. Uh, the other thing it can't account for, just to kind of build on what you're saying, is the fact of its presupposition that the democratic expansion of personal rights, personal freedoms, personal liberties within the sphere of civil society can advance and that in time, the sphere of economic rights can be treated in a kind of comparable or homologous way to those achievements. Mm -hmm. has continuously not been borne out. And mm -hmm. that presents a kind of limitation also, I think especially for someone like Habermas, around what that independent autonomous sphere of democratic communication vis-a-vis -vis civil society as a separate sphere can produce apropos collective education, collective enlightenment, etc. And I think we see this actually when we look at how in the advanced social democracies mm -hmm. in Central Europe in particular, the level of COVID conspiracy is very high. So if Habermas's thesis was sound, that wouldn't have been happening, you see? So there's something deleterious about that notion of the three-sphere thing. Now, let me also say, I think that Karatani's approach is maybe less a uh, victim to such errors of thinking. And I'm not going to go into the full details of his approach other than to say that um, he's worth reading. <laughs> Just, I'll put it that way. Like he's, he's a Kantian Marxist. I feel like um, a lot of philosophers, especially in their own, for various complex reasons, kind of um, phobias over Marxism, I think reading Kojin Karatani for, for professional philosophers would be a really, really interesting avenue in, in a way to enter into Marxist thought because he places, he has an argument against historical materialism in a very sophisticated way. And he says that part of the error of theorizing uh, 
a revolution a revolutionary socialism for which he still subscribes to by the way he still sees himself as revolutionary socialist but he says that part of the error was that the socialists theorized and i think this is somewhat true going back to the sphere theory that they theorized um revolution at the site of production mm -hmm. and as such that birthed a profound counter reaction instead of violent upheavals reactions etc and like I'll, I'll give you an example if you study zev sternhell's thesis about the birth of fascist ideology it's kind of an argument against historical materialism because what he says is that the birth of fascist ideology comes from George's Sorel. And Sorel was a socialist syndicalist throughout Europe. He's inspired all of these kind of worker agitations for many decades. And basically what ended up happening with Sorel was he decided to shift his emphasis of revolution into the sphere of the nation and the state. And that's where fascist ideology mer emerged from, Mussolini mm -hmm. and then Hitler in that transposition in that he tried strike after strike after strike worker agitation worker agitation nothing was successful nothing really led to what he wanted as a general strike that would overcome overwhelm the capitalist at the site of the factory owners and so he took on the liberal state bureaucrats as the main enemies of the ruling class in a way he was a vulgar PMC radical. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that to me was a kind of interesting point because Karatani thinks that, you know, um, there's a different way of revolutionizing that doesn't focus on the model of a base superstructure, but rather thinks of um, the organization of the proletariat into what he calls association movements. And this is why he says Kant was the first uh, socialist. Because in Kant's ethical and political theory, he thinks that is the trappings of how to organize a, a social protest against commodif commodified living. Because he thinks that uh, the sphere of liberty, the sphere of the market, is the one that fundamentally erodes all the other spheres. So in a way, he does privilege antagonism against that sphere. But he says that in order to do that, you need to organize exchange relations in modes of free association. Anyways, it's um, it, I, I'm just giving a very curt summary in part to ins recommend people look at Karatani. Okay. All right. So this is really great. Um, Honeth has a lot of problems, which we can talk return to, but let's let's actually go back to um, class and your your work on class. So You've written several essays on this topic and you put forward an idea of what you call class conflict theory. It's not your idea. It's a whole tradition of thinking. And I was wondering if you could kind of summarize what class conflict theory is. I, I kind of like it because in a way it's sort of very Marxist, but it's almost, it's almost like a way to speak about class as a phenomenon that can appeal to people that may not be signed up to the Marxist project in a way. And I was wondering if you could sort of talk about the discourse in academic studies of what's called class conflict theory and why you, why you subscribe to it. Um, so first of all, I think class conflict theory is, has comes in, in two variants. Um, and I'm not making this up. This is just what I take to be the basic sociological division of thinking. Um, there's a Marxist variant and um, a neo-Weberian variant that emphasizes class conflict, like the conflict part less, but accepts the reality of class divisions as points of tension um, and social stratification. Um, the, the version I defend is pretty unapologetically Marxist. I don't think there's any ambiguity about that. Um, I think if it's palatable to people who are not Marxist, it's because I'd simply put the arguments first and I think the arguments are true. Um, and if that's compelling, then it's a testament to the truth of the theory and not to my innovation. Um, I think 
that the best way to, to understand it is that um, class theories of class conflict posit that there is um, there there are actual social groups engaged in conflict, whether implicitly or explicitly, um, and this conflict takes shape um, as a result of the way they are positioned toward each other, and their a asymmetrical asymmetrically dependent relationships on one another. So um, historically, what Marxists have argued is that capital is dependent on labor to work, you know, for to exploit its labor power, and workers are dependent on capital for access to their means of subsistence. Um, and this relationship is mutually interdependent, but the argument is that workers have less power. Um, I think that the most, the clearest discussion of this is in an essay called The Two Log Logics of Collective Action by um, Klaus Offa and Heimat Wiesenthal, where they get into the basically the micro foundations of, of why that's so, why it might in fact be an interdependent relationship, but workers have a much more difficult time asserting their interests and are the more vulnerable um, party collectively. So what would you say the difference between the Weberian and the Marxist, these two general tendencies, how would you characterize maybe the, the core, where do they, where do they differ? So Marxists think that the means of production ownership over them and your relationship to them is a privileged axis upon which to understand this conflict and Weberians don't. They think that there are just many different resources you could own um, and the means of production is simply one of them. And so there is, they have a much more difficult time developing a kind of macro dynamic analysis of overall economic trends. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's, it's different. And then within the Marxist view, I would also invite you to say a little bit more about some of the maybe contrasting ways that people theorize class conflict theory. For example, mm -hmm. um, you know, on our program, we've interviewed folks who've pointed out some very helpful points that, you know, there's a lot of Marxists who believe that class struggle is an animating feature of social life. It's kind of maybe perhaps one of the core antagonisms to understand capitalist uh, life, et cetera, as an analytic. However, they don't go so far as to suggest that there's necessarily a ruling class, for example. Mm -hmm. So you have that kind of difference. And even like in a figure like Michael Harrington, the founder of the DSA, he was a, he called himself a democratic Marxist. So that means that he rejected the necessity which many Marxists put on the notion of dictatorship, a proletariat, but he also denied that um, classes necessarily uh, rule over one another. In other words, he almost saw it in a kind of different way. And I want to invite you to talk a little bit about that. Like, maybe I could start by asking you the question, do you believe it's helpful to speak of like a ruling class? Is there is there like a ruling class and how how might you sort of what would you say to a question like that? Yeah, I, I do think that there's a ruling class. I think it's that part of the interdependent relationship that is the less vulnerable party that has arbitrary power over the more vulnerable party. Um, but I, I just wasn't sure there is a connection that you made that I wasn't quite understanding. So you said that. Um, you were talking about whether or not there is a, a ruling class. And then you mentioned Michael Harrington and you said yeah. that you jumped to him calling himself an un a, a, or a Democrat. Democratic Marxist. Yeah. My, and then because he rejected the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat and honestly, no, both, I wasn't... Both, both, both. He rejected the, well, he was ambivalent. He thought that the status of the new class, the professional class mm -hmm. after the Second World War, could produce um, within the apparatus of the state the achievement of general Marxological goals, which means that he was not, in in a sense, a Marxist who is insisting upon um, the independent organization of the working class as first priority. He's not. Uh, so he, his whole theory of um, praxis, 
of organization of worker, how, how to achieve worker emancipation is reliant on a very careful collaboration with elements of the ruling class. Absolutely. It's not, it doesn't, according to many Marxists, I think present an adequate break there. And this actually introduces us, Lillian, I think to the question that we're grappling with today, which is the professional managerial class question. And I do want to, it, in time, invite you, but that was my clarification. And, sure, and okay, part but of that, and sorry, one more thing, part of that goes back wave in long history here. In the second international, before the third international, before the Bolshevik success of 1917, one of the main debates after the Bernstein controversy within Marxist circles was around whether we accept the transition out of capitalism as reliant on the theory of dictatorship of the proletariat. And it just so happened that many Marxists in the Western countries, especially in America, refused it. They refused that proposal of angles. And that comes with a lot of consequences, I think. And it kind of takes us back to the distinction that Honneth works with, you know, between civil society, democratic, etc. And I was just suggesting that when you take that angle, you, that's where the rubber meets the road, I feel. That's where uh, Marxists, maybe one way to think of how they part from each other if that makes sense. And I, and I was just saying that I think that the implication there is how one theorizes the ruling class, how to work with the ruling class, how to work with ruling class ideas, well, you know, the superstructure, the kind of cultural, social, political ideas that generate from ruling class that, so that I'm sorry, that, that was the clarification. Does that make sense now? Um, I, so I was asking about something different. Um, okay the it's the step in between the connection between those things i'm not sure about sure. so when you said in the first place that you're asking me if there's a ruling class yes and then you compared what i might say which i do think there is one okay. to michael harrington who thinks that there is not or is very amb ambiguous about it right. And he therefore calls himself a democratic socialist and he's right. therefore skeptical of the dictatorship of the proletariat. I actually have no idea how you go from there is a ruling class to like, maybe that would commit you to that whole other series of, of things where, you know, maybe in like, if I think there's a ruling class, then like maybe I'm not a democratic socialist and maybe I do think about the dictatorship of the proletariat. Like that ah, sequence okay. is not, is no, not no. to me. That makes sense to me. I guess my intuition and it is an intuition and tell me if you how you might parse this because i think this is a good debate is like isn't part of what makes a distinction between democratic socialists and revolutionary socialists maybe that's the distinction that i'm trying to home in on would be around maybe this question or rather we could even take a step back further and say do you think that the distinction between revolutionary socialism and democratic socialism is a pertinent or live wire one in our current political conjecture. No. Maybe I, maybe you don't think it is. Okay, there we go. That's the heart of the, sorry, it took so long for that to emerge, but that, so can you say more about that, please? Um, well, I think that you have to ask what you mean by revolutionary. Like there are some people who think that a revolution is necessarily like a movement that has the, the telos of insurrection. Um, and then there are people who think less about that kind of thing and want nonetheless a rupture or a break with the laws of motion of capitalism. And in that sense, it would be a, re a revolution with the, pre with the prevailing um, political system. Um, people think this would entail more democracy and, and so on. So, um, and, I, and I'm not sure that like, like, you know, even in the, in the past that ref, the, the debate about reform or revolution was not really um, like a zero sum trade-off between democracy and something else. Like if you like thinking about, mm, I don't know, people in the early, yeah, I guess maybe the, the third international, second international, when people are debating about you know, this classic Rosa Luxemburg debate, um, she was taking it for granted that reformists wanted a rupture with capitalism. Yeah. 
Um, and the it was the strategy for doing that and what would be sufficient that was at stake. And I don't think that really either side of that debate as it was implies a lack of commitment to um, democracy. I think there's a different strategies, different um, kind of roads to power, um, but it doesn't immediately suggest lack of democracy to me. And so I guess it doesn't actually make that much sense. And um, maybe even less so well, right now when we don't really have a strong mm -hmm. yeah. left. I, I think that's a fair point. I would I would respond by this. Don't you think though at the same time that And I'll just say even then, like even having said that, I still don't see why a claim that there is a ruling class would even generate that debate. Like I think that's like a debate that's like further down the road. You do. You know, okay. Like, so I don't think so that I actually is a position on democracy um or even strategy that follows from the idea that there's a ruling class. I think you can have very different strategies and very different visions of the future that come from that. I would suggest that the question invites a two things. One, it invites us to concretize our principles as political militants such that we avoid capture by the Democratic Party, by the nonprofit apparatus, and that we clarify the meaning of ideological forms that don't get lost in a kind of echo chamber, mm. which I think that the history of recent struggles have unfortunately been also come to. So in a way it is an intellectual and it is a philosophical question, even though there's no workers party. And I admit the existence of a workers party would help make that distinction more real, more live wire. So. There's that point I wish to make. The other point I wish to make is the kind of question of ideology. And I want to see what you think about ideology. Actually, I would be curious because in your article, you 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 put forward a really good critique of like Althusser, for example, and um, the way that Althusser actually didn't adequately address the class struggle in your in your view. And I'm wondering, actually, in your view, if you could speak perhaps a little bit about the category of ideology. I don't know if you've thought about it much and maybe even the category of ideology qua class consciousness, because I think one of the big debates we're having in these podcasts lately on the left is how one goes about doing class consciousness well, right? And um, I wonder I wonder if that might be a natural bridge for us from this debate. Because I, I think from our debate, I was trying to say that like, are there principles that we can stake down and insist on at this point, even though we lack the infrastructure, we lack um, a kind of institutional alternative working class, civil society, institutional framework. Isn't there still an illogical project that we should be engaged with? And in that project, isn't it important to kind of stake down strong principles? If that makes sense or like, how do you, yeah, like, um, yeah, yeah, so I, I, I think there, there are, I, I think that when there's the, there's a, a lack of a robust left and these institutions have completely decayed or are non-existent. So like, you know, the fact that, um, the Amazon, uh, workers in Staten Island, um, was it Staten Island or is it Queens? Anyway, I think it was um, Queens. Yeah. Queens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the fact that they won without a union aff affiliation should be um, not only in, without a union affiliation, but also they won outside of the capture of professional ideology. Their ideology was not informed of, by uh, that. I want to ask you the, about the link to ideology because I, I think it's a great question. Um, yeah. I just, again, like I think part of when I have conversations with people on the left that are more theoretical, my only, I'm just trying to connect the dots because I feel like a lot of the times people start talking past, past each other sure. based on different areas of expertise. So sure. I just kind of like, my effort is to like make sure we're on the same page. So the ideology question is good and I'm interested to hear what you think about it. Um, the institutional thing to recognize is that they did that without an association with an affiliated union. They might affiliate with the Teamsters, which yeah. I think would be great because the Teamsters are the only organization that has a national contract. And I think that a national contract for the Amazon unions is basically the long-term um, road that needs to go on. But the, um, 
and they did it outside the organized left. And that should yeah. make everybody pause. The mm -hmm. fact that you are both irrelevant mm -hmm. to the political process mm -hmm. in large part, and you are irrelevant to the working class who is your constituency. Mm -hmm. um, this should make everybody, like this should cause maximum consterna consternation mm -hmm. on anybody interested in um, working class politics, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that when we think about who the, like, that set of events means that it is possible for class form reformation to happen. Yeah. That people do in fact, like have in fact figured out through their own experience and they have posited beliefs about things like we are stronger together. Right. Um, I'm willing to take risks for the greater good. There's a whole set of like, you know, this is what I call in my paper. There is a learning process that those people went through together over the past several years. Yeah. Maybe this is kind of a pragmatist point where like a belief is really formed in habit. Like when it reorients your practical activity, that is when you can say a belief exists, which I'm not a metaphysician. I recognize that's a very controversial thing to say, but something like if, if, if that's useful for people to understand how class consciousness can evolve, I think that it might be useful thinking about it that way. Like yeah. people learned together the, the truth about their position vis-a-vis -vis their mm -hmm. employers and their management. Mm -hmm. And they came up with this solution, which is a solution that people have tried before. Lamentably, mm -hmm. they had to rediscover it without the help of existing in institutions, which is a massive indictment on mm -hmm. the part of the existing labor um, movement movement mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and of the left. Yeah. So, that's that, what I mean. Yeah, that's what I mean by ideology. That like the it was a. It, it's what Engels called ideological struggle, right? Which is that worker. He had the idea in his later work that worker ideology is from below, and it, it functions as a counterpower. And I think that one of the challenges that we have, because the academic left, um, the organized left, if you want to call it that. Comes I don't from call a, the academic left, the organized left, that the organized, organized left, left or much kind of more like, irrelevant, um, sadly. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. I, I, I totally think that um, it's not adequate to call it that, in part because um, the class composition of the leftist thinkers, the people doing podcasts, etc., mm -hmm. is extraordinarily varied. I do think, though, that um, when I went, okay, let me just return to the ideology piece. I think that we are currently in a deadlock around thinking this messy and thorny question about how ideologies uh, transmit to um, people in struggle concurrent to the, concurrent to the question, which we're re-injecting into our culture about how to raise class consciousness amongst ourselves and how to do that in a way when we're all flat-footed, we're all a, a little bit befuddled. And I think we should be humbled by that fact. And, um, and avoid a sensorial kind of um, inquisitorial way of processing that. And I, so I think that's part of what you're doing in a certain way. And, and I think we should be clear about that and the, um, the unknown level, like the Amazon thing was an unknown. There was such a beautiful thing to wake up and learn that they were doing this. And the fact that it caught everybody by surprise that studies these things is also extremely humbling. But I think it is a representation of ideology. So my question to you would be, how does how do you theorize like um, ideology and class a little bit? Have you thought about that intersection? Like, what does it mean a bit using this kind of frameworks that you've adopted in your work? Well, Could you say more about it, perhaps? Yeah, I, I haven't. You know, to be honest, I I haven't written much about ideology, and I find ideology as um, to be like a conceptual stumper, um, really? to be honest. Yeah. Um, but I will say how I, how I talk about the development of I ideas. Okay. Um, and I think that, I mean, like, so, so I, the reason I think ideology is a stumper, it's because one, it's, it's one of these much maligned concepts, not unlike Marxism in general, that I think is ultimately probably defensible. Um, but is very difficult to defend given the current disposition of the way of people in, in the field. Um, so I think it relies on some 
um, idea of truth, a kind of scientific realism about what there is to know, and that some ideas can obscure the, the truth, you know, understood in a nicely falsifiable yeah. and way in which, you know, properly scientific, where like, yeah, you, you there are going to be things that are better and worse, hypotheses that come and they go and we yeah. can try to test them. And, you know, so truth with, I guess, a small science T. And like, I think that if ideology depends on some idea of that concept of truth being viable, and then there are going to be ideas that mystify it and ideas that clarify it. So in other words, um, you're not you're not committed to a conception of ideology that would be working with strong T claims to truth, qua scientific status, or yeah, with especially within the field of something like class struggle. Because you know, I've been doing a lot of research about second international American Marxists who adopted pragmatism as their philosophical guiding light in the second international period from the 1890s up to 1920. And one of the big things there was precisely this issue, an ideological dispute that they had with Engels. They were writing mm -hmm. books like Engels 30 years after, and that when they adopted pragmatism, this goes back to my, that everything comes back full circle. That they, they said no dictatorship of proletariat because our conditions in America are unique. They said um, no to the necessity of the independent organization of the working class because our conditions are unique. In other words, they stripped Marxist practice. That, that went really well for us. It didn't work out at all. It didn't work at all at all. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is, but this is, this is the, the hard philosophical aspect of Marxism or one of them, you know, which I think is really an important thing for us to talk about. Um, and, you know, then there's the kind of question of, you know, pragmatism, positivism, and there's a whole, that's like a whole other podcast we could do. And I do want to actually do more conversations about that. Um but what I hear you saying is that you're not, at least at this point, signed up to, you know, conceiving of ideology like that. Is that kind of fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, um, I don't know, question, like metaphysical questions like that are not really, or even epistemological questions are not really my focus right now. So I, I'm not going to pretend to have a, a developed view. But my, um, my intuition is that science is never a capital T truth endeavor. And I don't yeah. think Marx thought so. And right. I have no idea what they were responding to with Engels. Mm. Um, I know that scientists don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, social scientists shouldn't think so. Um, and they by and large don't. And I just think like if that was people's requirement, like if that's why people doubted the viability of the concept of ideology, then like many other concepts in the Marxist tradition, you have really built yourself a a barrier to um, engaging with it that is unnecessary. And I'm not sure makes that much sense. Um, yep. You know, so. um, I want to, I want to bracket that and I want to return mm -hmm. to it in like future episodes because it does raise a huge thing. And I'm writing a review right now about um, a book called left out, which examines it's the most thorough analysis of American Marxist theory that's ever been written according to some other reviewers of the text, and it gets into this very important period, which is never studied that much about when American Marxism adopted pragmatism and what, what happened as a result. So we can, mm -hmm. we can, we can return to that, but let's, let's make a little pivot here with our remaining time and um, ask a couple more questions here about some of your research, which is really great. And I can, I'm going to link obviously to your article on why class matters. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you is, I really like the broad cast by which you define the working class. However, I was wondering if you find, and I know that you kind of take the side of E.P. Thompson in his debate with Althusser, and you 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 definitely um, place a big onus on the question of lived experience. Within that, I'm wondering. I don't think I use the phrase lived experience, and I'm sure it's intentionally so. Well, in the sense that E.P. Thompson himself placed an onus on that. And that was one of his divisions in his debate against like the structuralist school. And it, so this actually opens up my question. What do you make of sociological studies, Thompson, Engels, and Engels' study of the working class, et cetera, 
um, that do place an emphasis on the working poor and the suffering and degradation that the working poor experiences. Do you think that as a um, political theory and like kind of theorizing the working class, do you think that it's important to spotlight that kind of distinction? Because what it does, I just want to say one thing, is that it makes a further distinction in the class debate at the level of, of experience, which people theorize as denied, they theorize, et cetera, et cetera. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Because I will just say quickly, my view is that sometimes Marxists have a tendency to become ultra synthetic, I would say, where actually the question of the suffering of what goes on in working class in a true working poor sense kind of gets thrown out the window a bit. And I wonder if you think there's any value in centering working class suffering in theorizing the working class more broadly. Um, what do you mean by ultra synthetic? What I mean by ultra synthetic is conceptions of class, working class especially, that limit their definitions primarily to the wage contract itself and don't speak about these kind of surplus extra elements. Like, for example, um, what is the conditions of working class life, opioid overdose, uh, uh, premature deaths, especially of black yes. people, uh, um, in childbirth, for example, or like looking at kind of um, that level of experience, which differentiates, because in a certain sense, you could quite nicely make an argument in an academic venue or public professional venue by saying that the status of labor domination affects people as workers, as such, at that site. But that itself doesn't further distinguish the experiences of working poor, lumpen proletariat, middle class, upper middle class. And I think that there's a value in that Marxiological gesture, which is to say we're a big tent because that in that way it's you're on the side of solidarity. So you're promoting a greater sense of solidarity by by um, conceiving of class in a big tent way. And that's what I see your interest in there on the solidarity piece is like we need to start theorizing class from a broader tent and, and through non-domination and stuff. And I was just saying like, maybe there, do you think there's value in a flip side or do you think it's too thorny and too like volatile to kind of try to center that more experiential level? Does this make sense, Lillian? I hope this makes sense. It does. I, I just think it, they, they might be kind of sideways inquiries from each other like i think it really yeah. depends on your re research i didn't mean to say they're oppositional i was just no no, no I, I didn't mean to sort of set them up as as like that i just i, I think curious, it just I was yeah, curious I what you what you think the place of that is yeah i uh, think it really just depends on your, your question so like it's certainly true that the lives of the working poor and the poor in general are mostly invisible and when we're when we're talking about the oppressed and marginalized we're often like de facto talking about middle class people we just don't say it, you know? Um, and then we often have a lot of like suffering porn where you just kind of give these like um, images and descriptions of this extreme suffering. And um, my question is always like, it, that can be useful as a matter of, of awareness. Um, and my question is just always like, what is it useful for? Like, what do you want to do with that knowledge? Yeah, And I think that it's perfectly legitimate to bring it out into the open. open. You know, yeah. I think like oral histories can be really wonderful and illuminating. Um, what I think you can do with it is further um, class consciousness is what I would say in the pro project of political education. That would be my wager. I think that there is a trepidation in doing so, in part because the discourse has a tendency to promote such profound anti-solidarity. And then you have this kind of um, rivalrous sense of communities of suffering and how do you value that? How do you create a kind of, so it cre creates that problem. So that, but, but nonetheless, I was just simply saying that like e Eric Hobsbawm, Engels, E.P. Thompson, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, many thinkers on the left have really emphasized that kind of living condition dynamic. And I was just curious what you think about that. Um, um, I think it, I think it can be very valuable. Um, 
I like I said, I think it really just depends on, on yep. your question. And I think that the overwhelming emphasis in the social sciences at the moment is on something like that. And I think that what it's missing is its partner in a more um, adequate conceptualization. So if you what you are doing is exposing suffering, um, how to like you might indeed create a rivalrous sense of suffering or anti-solidaristic sense if you don't put the picture together. You know, there's like a, a usefulness of theory to create a worldview, to create an you know, and um, all theory is going to be limited and in some way, but there is a reason to organize, have a stylized organization of the facts. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah. If if your if your presupposition is that our culture has systematically sought to undermine class as a relevant form of social suffering, one could see the motivation there um, to 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 bring that about. But it does face the solidarity question, and that's actually. I think one of the things we should kind of um, close our, quest, our our time together with, which is the question of solidarity. I know it's really important to you, and for good reasons. <laughs> it's like uh, the one of the most important questions. And I guess maybe you know, how do you come at the question of solidarity? Like, how do you in your in your writing and stuff like that? You know, like how can we how can we achieve solidarity? And and sort of what do you also see as some of the main impediments? currently to to kind of worker solidarity cross class solidarity like yesterday i was doing a program on the family and i cited um the trend in late capitalism 70s now of assertive marriage which is a very interesting trend there's people get married more and more in their own class position middle class working class upper you know whereas the fordist period saw a huge variance in that non-assertative right there was all kinds of cross-class things and my wager would be that we're losing something in that because we're rigidifying class in a certain way culturally and we lose a way of thinking about those differences i don't know if that makes sense but let me that was just a comment but my main question is just talk generally about solidarity if you would um, well, I'm actually going to back up and go back to the theory question and sure. why it would be good to have a stylized organization of the facts. Um, I think when people talk about these different layers of, of oppression or suffering among the working class, um, the way that philosophers tend to discuss, discuss it is as things that are genuinely distinct. And normatively, that might be the case. You know, there are different harms associated with being um, more or less poor. Being homeless is not the same thing as not being homeless. Like there are having skills is not the same thing as having no skills. Um, there, there are normative differences, but something that people seem to stop at are those differences. And so I'll, I'll just use an example of um, like in the 90s, there was a discussion about the black underclass or Iris Marian Young wrote her five faces of oppression. And it was taken as given that the working class, right? Like that wasn't really a category that was under discussion, but there were some people that were exploited, wage workers. And then there are other people who are not exploited, the marginalized, the powerless, the underclass. And so, what we really need to draw attention to was those other even more oppressed groups. And it's quite clear when you read this literature that absolutely nobody involved in this debate has any inkling of the relationship between exploitation and those other situations. Mm. So the fact that capitalist competition is what explains the exploitation of labor and then the further need to exploit labor, okay, as it is determined both through intra-capitalist competition and inter-class conflict, creates a set of conditions in which capital has to um, do things to remain profitable, innovate on technology, increase labor productivity, um, reinvest, de-invest, do their thing, all things being equal, and that this dynamic, 
would generate massive unemployment, deindustrialization, the de-skilling, right, right, the cutting out of middle-skilled work in the United States, um, such that people can't reskill up or they have to reskill down or they just leave the labor market altogether. When I'm talking about theory, it is this picture that needs to be understood. We are not talking about just there are people who are only exploited and other people who are much more oppressed and those are the people we need to worry about. It is the dynamic of the whole that drives each of these kinds of oppression, given that there might be different normative problems with each. And so this is what I mean about having a left political theory. It is a theory that seeks to integrate the whole. And yep. when we have um, a conversation about solidarity, the question then becomes, what interest do people who are gainfully employed have in raising the level of employment of the whole or having social protections or having more support for women? Okay, like what would the effect on the whole be if that were to be true? And I think that like this kind of conversation is for the most part absent. And, and my question is always like, do you think that everything is getting worse for everybody and yet somehow women on the whole are doing better. That that doesn't sound right to me. So middle class women like myself, okay, are maybe doing better, you know, because discrimination is as it is on, at a low at a low tide and there's kind of implicit affirmative action and so on and so forth. But working class women have had the same degradations of their living conditions, the same um, uh, uh, encroachments upon the social safety net, and they are still having children and so on. And then you say, oh, and you say men, they have a high suicide rate. Their only marker of so social status, which is employment, is hard to come by, and therefore they are also oppressed. Great. Why don't we expand employment through a massive industrial policy, expand the social safety net so that and have, you know, what Nancy Fraser calls a two caregiver model in which men work less, care more, women also work less and probably care a little less as well. Um, why don't we make things better for everybody? That's solidarity. And people who understand that is what that would entail. And mm -hmm. people who develop practices and habits that train their brains to see it that way, which is normally what happens in collective organizations, yeah. why this is so unclear to academics. But when I give my talk about class, like give this paper to people in labor, like I did a labor party event, which was wonderful with Victoria Bufacci in, um, in Ireland. Those people understood what I'm saying because mm. they have been in labor, the labor movement for 20 years. So this is, this is a, it's, there, there has to be a combination of worldview building with political practices that support a common sense of mm. we mm. are going to make things better for everyone. And mm -hmm. we can do that in a way that appreciates, for example, that women have particular vulnerabilities and child care. Fine. But we're still going to make it better for everyone. Mm. Beautiful. Nicely done. I'm 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 pretty much signed up to that vision. I'm still <laughs> I'm no, I really am. I mean I'm still curious about the independent organization of the working class question, just having done a lot of historical research on this question in my own reading of, of Marxist history, Marxist thought, um, things do tend to uh, play out that way. In other words, and this would be maybe my final question to you in this interview, uh, I'd love to chat with you again. How do you, how do you think that we might manage the PMC um, debate? Um, I know it's a frustrating debate um, in part because everyone in a weird way is a part of the PMC, um, at least in, in, in our kind of orbit. Um, so it becomes kind of a question of, well, uh, it, it becomes complicated, but nonetheless, like what I, what I think is interesting here is that you're producing a model of thinking about collective liberation and solidarity that will frankly circumvent some of these um, less compelling ideas that have maybe d been derived out of mm, i don't know but let, let me before i even guess let me ask you what you 
What do you make of PMC theory? And I mean specifically um, some of the critiques of the category in post-Trump period by members on the left. Jacobin supports this and to some extent, and um, members of the post-left obviously really support it. I'm I'm kind of torn on it myself. I have my own ideas on it. I'm curious. I'm curious how you might navigate it in recognition of how thorny it is. What would you What would you say? Um, I think it's it's a it's a real thing and a real problem. Um, I am I'm not exactly sure how I how I would de define it. You know, credentialing and skills and um, so on and so forth. Like you know being middle class. Um, but I think that what I'll say what I don't get about people's response to this, okay. um, I don't understand the the hostility toward the, the critique of the, the PMC. Um, to me, mm. it sounds like academics who have told themselves for 40 or 50 years that they are the inheritors of radical liberation movements of the new left. And as it turns out, um, they have significantly changed those ideas, adapted them to a middle class milieu, and now they are upset that someone has noticed um, and that it's not representative of the most marginal people in society, that they are not the, are the, the tribune of the oppressed within academia, mm. um, that there's an ideological critique to make of them, and they are not the only critics. I think that people have reacted like... Um, oh, no, we couldn't have done anything wrong. And I think right. that if you are an academic who is genuinely interested in justice in this world, um, you need to take a step back and realize yeah. that you may, in fact, have, be um, subject to criticism from people who are outside of your milieu and that it can be legitimate. So that's my, my first point of view. My second is that I, I think that often it's talking about cultural habits and dispositions that are, in fact, alienating to a lot of people. Um, but... You know, you have to kind of like figure out what um, whether or not that necessarily makes people, you know, uh, anti, you know, some kind of antagonist to a working class movement. And the answer is not always, of course not. Mm. You know, highly educated tech workers have a, have a role to play. Highly skilled workers have always been at the forefront of, um, you know, fights for self determination over conditions of work and everything. So, um, if people at Google or whatever are learning that having a union is good for them, okay, they're going to be a highly skilled workforce that doesn't have that much in common culturally with the rest of the workforce. Hmm. But like, God damn it, or like unionize Google. Yeah. Or like that. Um, that's going to be good for everybody in the long run. So the cultural angle isn't like always the, the, the zero sum problem. Mm -hmm. And I think people would do well not to think about it that way. You know, like, you know, grad student unions, I tried and failed to organize a union at my, when I was a graduate student. And I'm very proud that actually just a couple of weeks ago, they, they won their union. Right. Um, there is a certain kind of cultural politics and everything that's going to en enter into mm -hmm. these um, organizing environments. It can be counterproductive. It can be mm -hmm. helpful whether you like it or not, something to navigate. And it's not going to be like the kind of unions that form elsewhere. Cause again, these are highly credentialed people. And just cause you don't make a lot of money doesn't mean you're not integrated within a milieu that anticipates certain returns, yeah. certain behaviors and everything. Well, it, um, it, nonetheless, yeah. I think that unions and higher education are an unequivocal good and that, you know, what is needed in the long run is pub more, more, if not complete public funding for, um, public institutions of higher education to make um, trade schools and so on. So if unionizing academia helps people develop a structural understanding of the problem, then I'm for it. You know, that I think that can only be good in the, in the long run. So mm -hmm. I don't know if this answers your question. No, I it think does. Yes, no, it does. there is a real problem. And it's also acknowledging that problem isn't like the end of the conversation. And I simply wish people were, were less, less hostile. I can't tell you um, if there's one thing that's going to alienate, alienate me from a conversation with academics, it's going to be a defensive posture as if there is just nothing to see here. And mm. I, I think it's. Thank you, Lillian. Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back to the question I posed, which is, is ideology bound up with a class project? And I think that that's a, 
proposition which we need to consider more seriously and um but but carefully and not jump the gun and say that all ideas from the pmc further the ruling class but i do think that there is a tendency within the pmc broadly speaking to disavow the notion of ruling class and to disavow the idea that what's generated could in any ways uh, further a ruling class conception and that goes back to this notion of democratic marxism and some of the pitfalls historically that have come with that certain conception of a kind of fluid theory because you know what it also is premised on it's also premised on a theory of educated enlightenment knowing better for workers in a way and that kind of goes back to the fact that sometimes the most enlightened gets surprised by christian smalls of the world and you never know what can happen 40, year, 40 years of death of the working class and here we are teachers have a strike wave in 2018 starbucks workers are organizing in every state and i don't know plurality of states um amazon workers have organized their first union and i think that um the success of those that those movements um you're gonna we're gonna be in a pretty different political situation um in the event of that success and i think a lot of people will have to be eating their hats as it were um i i so I'll fin finish your thought about ideology and class. I think I think it's something for people to think about. I, I mm -hmm. don't I don't want to remain stridently dogmatic. I think we need to be humble. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's something to, to consider. Like I agree basically with what you're saying, and I think that we need to be students of history um, on these matters. So you know, I think the conversation needs to be continued, and this is sort of a a platform, and your podcast is also a platform for processing these. Um, really important things in ways that maintain solidarity, right? Um, so yeah, but that, I guess that's my general thought for now, please. Yeah, I'd say that um, I think that the very orthodox and, and boring answer to this question for me um, is that it's a matter of whose hegemonic project you wanna be a part of. I think that there is basically the hege hegemony of the bourgeoisie, and I think that the alternative is, alternative is the hegemony of labor. Um, I think that people who, you know, um, think, like, I, I, I'd say this, I think there is an absence of understanding of the need for the labor movement in every single discussion I'm in on the academic left about emancipatory social movements. So the, if you say labor movement, the first thing they will say is it's not just labor, you know, and then they'll say independent feminist organizing or the black freedom movement, you know, and then the, the, it's almost like you say labor and people are like, wow, can't like it, the immediate reaction. It's really incredible. Immediate reaction, hostile, defensive, aggressive. You must be a dinosaur and so on. I think the way to think about it is that um, there is a need for various social movements. And I think there will be a need for social movements under socialism. I think that basically democratic politics at work. Um, and I think that the, the question is, who do you want to hitch your wagon to? What social force in society is going to allow for a hegemonic project that gets the returns that you want on your, your goals? And at the moment, the left has been allied with a portion of civil society that is basically allied with capital. And that's what makes it a professional middle class left, not just like the specific cultural traits or the jobs right. people have. It's right. those institutional linkages that make it um, a left that has wittingly or unwittingly allied itself with a bourgeois hege hegemonic project. Mm -hmm. By contrast, labor is a different alternative. And I think if there's anything that can happen, it's it's turning people's eyes there. And it's not that labor is going to answer all your questions. Certainly trade unions aren't, you know, there's a scope, um, but it's who is your ally? And I think labor is the most central ally of any social movement, period. Um, and labor I, or the working class? What would you, would you say? Or is, is the I'm working class? Things, I'm using so those You're using synonymous. them synonymously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But I mean, when working class people organize collectively, yeah. their institutions, um, whatever their limitations are, and there are limitations to all of them, 
Mm-hmm. I think that the it's it's like if I was if that was a camper, I think feminists, anti-racists, um, queer activists, hook your steel hook on the back of that camper. Right. And you can take it off. You can do your other things. Yeah. Right. You, there's no need to limit your politics to what labor is doing, but you need to be on the highway with them. The alternative is to be on the highway with capital in the other yep. direction. And I think yep. that's basically, um, I don't know if that's a helpful metaphor. I just thought of it, but that's, it's that's really, kind of- yeah, it's really good. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that's neat. like every co- conversation we have here. I feel like we need to just, we've just begun, <laughs> but like there's, there's one maybe elephant in the room in the sense of um, the entrepreneurial liberal uh, ideal of our society which does undermine the because you know working class is a question of political identification and one of the things that discourse theory gets right is that it does see class consciousness as a political of a political identification issue so, working class and, consciousness is a matter of political identification not the fact that the working class exists that's my opinion i agree with that but i think that the two relate importantly and i also think that it is it's multifaceted but you know what i meant specifically was like why for example have the squad been kind of maybe unsuccessful in their efforts to talk about people as workers and i would i would say that there's a sunk preventative aspect of our culture which is the independent entrepreneurial aspect prevents people being willing to see themselves as workers and even as working class. And part of that is owed to the hangover of the Fortis welfare state that, and that imaginary that we all have of it and it's leisure time and it's um, exemption from forms of wage labor that some had access to more than others. Part of it's that hangover, but part of it's a hangover from the Gilded Age and the very origin of this form of capitalism that we live with, which has been premised as a ruling class device to promise a mobility out of the working class. And, you know, if you talk to any Uber driver or anyone, you know, really that is where the rubber meets the road, in my opinion, when it comes to class consciousness, because at the end of the day, they're going to come back to you and say, well, what's that really going to deliver to me? How am I going to advance myself? So there's that whole tricky dynamic at play. Um, but I feel like that's a whole other can of worms. Sorry, sorry to throw that on you. But I just want to say that I thought this was a really, really fun conversation. And I really got a lot out of it. Um, Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I know we, we touched on a lot. And uh, we'll have to have you on again. What? Uh, let me close by asking you what your current current projects are in the world of research and writing? Um, I'm working on a book manuscript. It's called The Competitive Constraint, um, subtitled A Critique of Capitalist Domination. So I think I'll have the manuscript done by the end of this calendar year, and I'll be, um, if not, I think before, and then I'll be working on revising it and publishing it. And then um, I think uh, I also have an article coming out in Hypatia next year about um, reproductive rights and political economy. And then um, I have an article, I think, coming out in a new Italian journal um, about Nancy Frazier. It's called Revista um, Italiana, I think. Um, So yeah, if people wanna, are interested, check those out. Very nice, very nice. Lillian, thanks for your time. Really, really delightful. We'll we'll be in touch and hope to have you on again. Bye, everyone. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.